the topic that's listed on the board is something about the police. And I'm not actually talking about the police. I'm talking about being a police chief. My subject is not policing, it's police chiefing. Those are two entirely separate things. Incidentally, those of you, and I notice you tend to be younger, who are sitting in the back rows, did not take <clears throat> the second year course at topology at this university a number of years ago, because I will now never sit toward the back since it says bad things about you. But I won't tell you what they were, because I'm happy you're here. Um, uh, so so the, the question is, what is it like to have a job where under ideal circumstances, the boss is most pleased when nothing happens and nobody notices? Probably you have guessed that this is police chief. And it is police chief. Um, I'm going to tell you why this is so. And, and, and a lot of this is based on the fact that I was the director of the Illinois State Police for seven years. Very few of you realize the significance of that statement because the average length of tenure of a police chief in the United States of a large department is three and a half years. I doubled it. One of the reasons <coughs> that the tenure tends to be so short is that your reputation and everything you've done can be ruined by one single officer serving maybe 250 miles away from you who does something really stupid. So there's a certain amount of luck involved. But before those seven years, I spent almost all of my life dealing with police officers as partners. I am a person who has never in his entire life had a warm and fuzzy job, not once. Uh, the one interval I think maybe uh, Judy Stein left out, Judith Stein left out, uh, was uh, before I was at the Illinois State Police, I was the Illinois tax collector. I was the director of revenue. They, I'm not a person who you would, if you don't know as a friend, you would ordinarily like to see knocking on your door <laughs> asking to speak to you. Um, and I suppose it says something about me that I really like those jobs. Um, and, and my subject here is really uncommon because it, it, it's the rarely mentioned incentives that police chiefs have that I'm going to talk about. Not police officers, police chiefs. And, and this is the kind of talk I guarantee you no one ever delivers when they are currently a police chief. You would never say these things in public. In fact, I may say some things today that if you testify somewhere that I said them, I'm going to deny it. Uh, the first thing is the world they live in. Um, the police chiefs are public figures. <clears throat> They're very public figures. Your demeanor, your public talk are governed by basically the same rules that apply to a good physician. Um, who basically, and this is an important thing for physicians that I think some patients don't fully understand, you want and need the confidence of your patient. And that means that the truth has to be spoken very carefully and calmly. A doctor wants reassurance. A, pan a, a patient who panics usually harms himself. Substitute police chief for doctor and public for patient, and you get the idea. Uh, your doctor will translate medical language into common language, and in doing so is going to admit certain crucial details. Uh, things that the speaker does not think you need to know are certain that you're not going to understand. And there's a significant wrinkle in my analogy of the police chief to the physician. That wrinkle is, is that patients usually know that they don't understand it all when the doctor speaks and, and acts. And, and they know they can't really get it all because they aren't trained as physicians. A police chief, by contrast, deals with a public, virtually all of whom think they know enough about policing to make useful suggestions. And, and it's not surprising that, that ordinary citizens are convinced of this not necessarily because they've encountered crime on their own, but there is always crime in the neighborhood. There's always something that bothers you. You can have the lowest crime rate in the world and still people will be disturbed. You can, ironically, studies have shown, have a very high crime rate and people not be disturbed. Uh, sometimes because they get used to it or sometimes because they think that it occurs three or four blocks away, they're safe. But basically, 
what the police chief has to deal with uh, are aldermen, community leaders, and ordinary citizens that think police service would be much better if they were in charge, or at least that the police did as they told them to do. These same people do not tell the surgeons how to operate, but, and all of them have roughly the same amount of police training uh, and police experience as they do of medical training and medical experience. That is zero. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons that I'm not talking to you about policing itself, it is a highly technical business. Uh, there are lots of do's and don't do's, things that are very minor, things now today that have scientific bases, and it takes a good long time to learn them. In the, uh, in the old days, a police officer would have three weeks training. Uh, and become a police officer and everything else was on the job. And if you were on the job for about seven years, you finally knew how to do it reasonably well. Uh, most training programs for police today uh, are uh, half a year. Uh, and then you have a field training period that can sometimes last up to two years. And then, then and only then are you a rookie. You've raised your, your uh, level to rookie. Um, but unlike the doctor, who, when they receive a, a, uh, a petition, for example, as my physician did, a yeah, professor of cardiology, he did some group, this was uh, maybe 30 years ago, and it l turns out that they may have been right, one of those odd things, but they demanded that the standard medical course for people beginning at the age of 40 was to take statins. This was in the days when statin, for those of you old enough to remember, was called Mevacor. It was the, about the only one on the market. Um, fairly expensive drug then, uh, and its effect uh, was absolutely not fully known. But there were people that had petitioned this physician, who was the expert in the field, to make this a standard of practice. And standard of practice is very important in legal cases because the standard of medical malpractice is did your treatment of the patient accord with accepted general standards for this particular condition? So basically, he's changing basically the law that governed physicians. Uh, none of these people understood anything beyond what had appeared in a Newsweek article, that this may be a lifelong drug. Um, the same thing happens to the police chief, not once in a lifetime as it happened to my physician, it happens almost every day, and unlike the doctor, the police chief has to pay attention to the sideline expert. They have no choice but to do that because they are public figures. In recent years, a lot of this outside advice, this enormous, maybe the best possible word, which I think many of you will understand, but there are synonyms for it, the police chief will usually, a police chief in a city of, say, three million people, will be lucky if he's list down to like 4,000 kibitzers, whispering in his ear about what he should or should not do. Some of this is going to be blamed on a lot of police television shows. Uh, television offers, interestingly enough, in, in recent years, a more reliable picture of what police work is like. Uh, but it's a very narrow spectrum of police life. Dragnet did a nice job of it. Uh, but it's all detectives. It's all things that happen post-crime. Patrol, which is the largest part of policing, is almost never depicted. And when patrol is depicted, as it is on reality shows, little cameras in the front window of the car, um, humorous drunk driving arrests, um, and although, based on my experience in the state police, it's very difficult for me to accept drunk driving as humorous, but there are some incidents where, at least at the end of it, it is a little funny. They don't show the thing that requires the most skill and the most intelligence and the most judgment, and that is the decision of the officer whether or not to intervene. Do you let it go? Do you intervene? And if you intervene, how do you intervene? This is never, ever depicted. Um, so police, people who come in and advise the police, really are completely ignorant, even of television 
kind of education of what is mostly important to police. You, I, I have never seen a program that dramatizes crime prevention. How can you have a program that dramatizes crime prevention? The crime doesn't occur. Where's the drama? Who's going to watch? You'll have a rating of zero if you, if you give this. And this is the thing that could educate the public. And, and almost nobody writes letters or assembles groups of people to talk to the fire chief. Never happens. Chicago Commissioner of Fire almost never has a group of citizens telling them how they should fight fires or how they should handle burning buildings um, or how to prevent fires. Everybody understands they don't know this. They think they know how to deal with the police. Um, the, the only solution actually to this problem is a solution that will never occur. The police chief is going to have to live with this forever. There's, there's no way out of it. It could occur, for example, if the level of public concern with crime and, and, and uh, law and order in general, say, for example, was the uh, same level of concern that the people of Phoenix, Arizona would evince about Great Lakes water problems. In other words, zero. But that's not going to happen. And crime is never absolutely going to go away. So the police chief will, every single one of us, have to deal with these sideline experts. There is no choice. Um, the public usually starts off with the police chief uh, because something has bad has happened in their neighborhood or sometimes happened themselves. Uh, this can range from the well-known broken windows problems, and they may not be well-known to you, but Wilson at Harvard pointed out that if you have a lot of broken windows in the neighborhood, the neighborhood starts to go downhill. People think everything is up for grabs. Um, and police started to respond to that. Uh, there is a breakdown of neighborhood order. There can be a rash of purse snatching. But there can be a rash of armed robberies. And in some rare cases, a rash of killings. Solutions are always demanded, and pretty much all of the solutions fall into the send more police category, buy more anti-crime equipment, make officers better, prevent crime somehow. And the pressure does not go away if you don't respond. It eventually gets down to, and this was done in New York City, a serious proposal that you put a police officer on every corner 24 hours a day. Now, it couldn't have been all that serious because you could actually do that at spectacular cost and really substantial raises in taxes, which people wouldn't put up with. So the police chief is, goes into a mollifying mode. Uh, the well-known thing you see with people today when something bad has happened, I understand your pain. I sympathize with your emotions. I know what you're going through, which if you're listening very carefully, it doesn't do you a lot of good. It shows sympathy. They're not pushing you out the door. Frequently, this works. People go feel that you've, you've heard them and that you might do something. They don't exactly know what they, you, that you uh, are going to do, but they will sometimes go away. But that hue and cry sometimes persists more than a couple of days because it's a group because it's a community leader. Because the community leader might be personally disturbed by what happens, or the community leader might have some latent political ambitions and sees this as the start of some constituent group that can get this person elected to office. Um, when the hue and cry persists, then the police chief has to meet and confer with the outsiders. And the the basic tactic of the police chief is to draw the citizens into the police frame of reference. You, and, and people accept being drawn into it because they believe that they're getting an explanation. What they're generally getting is not an explanation. What they're generally getting is terminology and models and some stuff you can read about in a book on criminal uh, justice administration. And what they talk about today, they used to talk about this differently. What they talk about today is the three basic models of police departments. And this applies 
to state police, it applies to police in, in uh, urban areas. It doesn't particularly apply to small departments, but it's not small departments, generally speaking, where the problems arise. And it's important to understand these three models. The first one is called police professionalism. And this is the theory that police, best results come when the police are highly trained, well-equipped, capable of many tasks, uh, very similar to the model of the Illinois State Police. Uh, in fact, a, a state trooper today will be trained in things that a Chicago police officer won't be trained in. Uh, a, an Illinois State Trooper graduating the academy will be able to deliver and will have been trained to deliver and will be tested on its ability to deliver advanced first aid. Why? Because a lot of their needs occur in rural areas where there, an ambulance is going to take an hour to arrive, if it arrives at all. You don't need this in the Chicago Police Department. In the Chicago Police Department, you might need to know how to stop somebody bleeding profusely. But by the time real serious, more advanced treatment is required, the fire department is there, because they take care of that. So police training may not be uniform, but it all involves careful training and careful testing and annual refreshing of skills that are particularly needed. Um, in this model, police are trained to recognize significant details of a very large number of events and record them accurately. Uh, information technology is the, clear, is the key. There is, in fact, a police science, and technology is many times more important than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and, and none of the stuff that's available to the police is easy to use, at least easy to use well. Top-down command is important. Top-down command was very difficult uh, to manage, uh, even 20 years ago. But now with communications, it is uh, easy to demand. And in fact, um, two years before the founding of this university, I'm sure all of you know this, uh, the city of Chicago installed the Gamewell Police Telephone and Signal Company's police signal system, first in the nation. And a police officer could be called, a little light would flash. Uh, by 1893, there were four million calls on the system because you couldn't call the police station. The police station, if you could call them, couldn't call the police officer. And it revolutionized police practices, but it still didn't permit uh, top command. Uh, you today have many cars equipped with video cameras. So somebody at headquarters can start looking through the sign saying, well, do this, do that, do the other thing. Um, almost every police officer in an advanced department uh, will take some basic les lessons in the sociology of the jurisdiction. And almost all of them are trained in psychology to the extent that it requires dealing with disturbed people or making judgments about repetitive calls from some individual. None of these are one afternoon courses. All of them take a long time. Uh, the exams are difficult and many people have to be retrained. On top of it, most police professional uh, organizations are distinguished by the fact that they don't really have a lot of fat police officers. They look better. They wear their uniforms better. They inspire confidence. They look like the, pretty much like the guys you would expect uh, to uh, land in helicopters in, uh, in uh, Pakistan. And, and this inspires confidence in many people. The other model, which everybody hears about is community policing. It was, for a long time, the flavor of the month. It's losing a little of its flavor now. The key to effective policing, the theory is, is close and frequent consultation with civilians in the community, forming relationships, listening carefully to what the people have to say, and getting them to listen to what the police say. That latter portion is sometimes the more difficult one. But often, in a good system, it will work. The idea is the um, 
police and the community become two sides of one coin. Uh, computers are important, sure, but they are not as effective as 500 pairs of eyes and ears of average citizens in their own neighborhood. The third form of police model looks a lot like professionalism, but it really isn't. It's the one everybody's heard about lately. Intel or information-based policing. Those are the programs where you see the police are assigned out of maps, not the old maps with pins, computers. A new map is drawn every day. The idea is police will know where crime is likely to happen, marshal its resources to reduce its occurrence, and then when crime is displaced, because that's what happens, do a real good job suppressing crime on 55th Street. You uh, may see a rise in crime. Um, this is um, very popular. Bring citizens in, you describe these things as models. Usually, the section maybe is too strong a word. The way the police chief phrases this makes the average citizen think, well, look, there are discrete methods that police chief is explaining it to us, and consequently, we'll understand, understand that so we can make wonderful give wonderful advice to the police. We may even be able to solve a problem. But the truth is, none of these models are true models. None of them are well-defined. The boundaries between these organizations are really not clear. And you usually find all three of them present in any single police department. Most police chiefs will pick one as representing the philosophy of their department. And they can change the emphasis in very short order. And you do it based on how well received the particular label you're using is. You stand up to a group of communities and you say, well, this is professional policing. We're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing the other thing. You get really loud applause, you stick with professional. If community works, then you stick with community. Um, and, and you can do this because every single large police department does all three of these things. Sometimes professionalism is limited to a few elite units. Sometimes it is not. Good intelligence has existed in all police departments. And almost any time you have police officers interacting with citizens, which you have to have, you're going to call it community policing. None of these models is flawless, even if they were pure. The problem with the professional model is it encourages an elite mindset that diminishes the ability of police officers to connect with the public. Because if you have really good people, highly trained, uh, they will eventually come to believe that they are better than others. And if you believe that, there are not all that many people who can disregard it. And the public will sense that you're talking down to them. And this is not what you want. Um, the command structure, thing where the guy in City Hall or police headquarters controls what's happening, <coughs> is also a problem because in real life, the police officer with the single most discretion in his or her job is the lowest ranking officer, because that's the officer on the street. And the street is where these things happen. Community policing often degrades into endless talk at community meetings, where the, the police approach is, again, we share your pain, we understand your concerns, we are with you. And those are just words. The, um, other problem with community policing is it sometimes turns into a uh, means 
for some people to advance political agendas. This is, in fact, one of the single greatest problems. It also, and this is the more subtle one, you get communities tight-knit, willing to cooperate, want a good result from the police. They go to the meetings, the police respond. Solve a problem, solve one or two problems. Maybe solve every single problem. Within a year, studies have shown, the community starts to, to abandon all of its own efforts to solve some of these problems. They unload it on the police. And what the police do is take it on themselves and many times solving it. This, by people who don't like community policing, has been referred to the police functioning as a laundry. Community brings all its dirty linen in and the police clean it up and return it to them. It's not community policing. It's not community directing. It's not community setting priorities or helping to set priorities. It's communities dumping stuff on the police. The intelligence-driven model is based on probabilities and its algorithms that rarely produce results that satisfy the public and often don't satisfy the police who use them. And most importantly, the most reliable intelligence is often acquired by the, an officer who is on the beat, who knows a community, who knows who is who, and knows what each one of them does or what their tendencies are on his local beat. It's very difficult to code this knowledge into programs. You, you actually have to take the ComStat version, which tells you where occurrences have occurred, and match that with intelligence. And that's not so easy to do. And in fact, there's no one who's doing it really successfully now. And then, of course, the idea of moving officers from one place to another, uh, because you want them to address crime problems. Too much reassignment to predicted crime surges. And what you wind up with is very few officers who know their territory. And you have very few officers who know their territory because no specific territory is theirs. So you lose that in intelligence uh, value. Basically, the value of, of describing these programs, of using these labels, the value of this to the police chief is that you demonstrate, you're able to demonstrate to the unqualified civilian that the problems are more difficult to resolve than they had thought. And outsiders will begin to accept the proposition that most recommendations for change basically put themselves into a zero-sum game. And you move the police to A, neighborhood A, problems increase in B. Police statistics are hard to interpret. And I leave aside the incentive that police may have to manipulate those numbers. Now, this, if you're a police chief, has solved most of your problems. Problems being the public you serve and the ones who are speaking a lot and gumming up the works, because frequently that's what they will do. They will gum up the works. Um, you. Um, discourage most of them from going further. Uh, but uh, there's some people you can't discourage. Powerful alderman might be one of them. And the other thing you must remember is, and incidentally, one, one of the other techniques you can use if you're a police chief, remember I talked about neighborhood A and neighborhood B? If you're really being forced in a position to do something special for neighborhood A that is not going to help neighborhood B, you send emissaries to the community leaders in neighborhood B. And eventually they come to your office and start screaming and yelling. And if you're really good, you will have a room full of people. On that side will be neighborhood A, and on that side will be neighborhood B. And if it gets heated enough, you can actually leave the room without their ever noticing. I personally have never done this. Don't ask me that under oath, but <clears throat> um, the truth is um, fending off, and that's what you're doing in most cases, takes a lot of time and effort from actual policing. 
Um, and even higher social costs are imposed if a citizen's group is politically adept and cannot be deterred, and a police chief has to yield. Um, the, and let me give you one last word. This is maybe the only serious thing. A last word on models. Police success depends on a variety of things, but the one absolutely essential thing is that individual police officers want their enterprise to succeed. And draw, and now it does, they draw great satisfaction. True of any model, current or yet to be. Don't have a devoted police officer, don't have somebody who cares, um, all is lost. Um, budget troubles. You would think that police chiefs don't like budget troubles, and some budget troubles they don't like. But a little budget trouble is very good because uh, you can fend off a lot of very bad ideas by laying the blame on budget troubles. You don't have to stop and persuade somebody that their idea is bad or that someone's harebrained, which is very hard to do. I mean, first of all, you never use the phrase harebrained. Say it's not a good thing. Or it's a great idea, we don't have the resources to do it. Sometimes you can transfer this whole morass over to some poor alderman. Go see your alderman. See if he can get us more money. When you know, and the alderman knows, that he can't do that. Uh, another great thing is a cheap demonstration program. Of course, is with the cheap demonstration program, you've taken resources away from real police work. Um, another thing, and, and it, this is, is, I think, one of the most troubled things, troubling things in police administration, and that is police sensitivity. And now I'm talking about police officers, not chiefs. Police sensitivity to public opinions. You have to consider the attitude of the rank and file toward public opinion. Um, public complaints about the failure of police um, are, are, if broadly broadcasted, are damaging to police morale. Many police, maybe most, sense a lack of support for them in the community. Part of this is true of the fact that many people they encounter, if you're a police officer, many of the people you encounter are not going to like you. They're not going to particularly approve of being stopped in the street. They're not going to approve of being arrested. They're going to say rotten things to you. There are, in fact, ways to diminish even this. Uh, and, and the single one that's been established by studies is demeanor of the officers. Uh, and I give you an example. Um, when I was director of state police, the state police started patrolling the expressways that had been the Chicago Police Department job within the city before. And I was asked by the uh, superintendent of police why uh, I had, uh, particularly on what were thought to be roads going through bad neighborhoods, and why I had one trooper in a car rather than two. Chicago police always had two. And I thought it would work. I wasn't certain. And it did work. And one of the reasons it worked is, historically, um, if you get stopped by a state trooper, and let's assume that you are the, a member of whatever the most despised minority group there may be in this particular area, you're driving a ratty old car, and you're wearing a t-shirt with holes in it, and the trooper asks for your license, and your license says, my name is John Smith, the trooper will say, is this your car, Mr. Smith? Or he may ask you, if you, Mr. Smith, do you know how fast you were driving? Chicago police officers in exactly the same circumstances, and not necessarily only with despised minorities, but with all, average citizens, will say, well, Johnny, where the hell were you going? You do that often enough. And you get in a situation you see in federal court today, which is if a trooper is sued, the trooper wears his uniform to court. If a Chicago police officer is sued, they are told to wear civilian clothes. So demeanor is a big factor.
But even with the best of demeanor, there are going to be a fair number of people who don't like you, and those are going to be the majority of people you see, unless, for example, you're really very lucky and you deliver 100 babies in the backseat of a squad car. Then you're going to have a lot of grateful people. But even where demeanor is not a strong point of police, the fact is the statistics show, not the encounters on the street, the statistics show overwhelming support for police, usually above 80 percent, and there are very few politicians who have 80 percent approval ratings. You see it from the general public, and the line officer simply does not know this, or it seems unrealistic to them. The public trusts the police. The public may trust the police even when they shouldn't, but they do. Media criticism of police conduct in specific cases can lead the police to believe that the public does not have, in the current um, parlance, that the public does not have their back. They are wrong. But the police chief has to cope with this impression as a reality when dealing with armchair generals demanding police changes in tactics and strategies. Now, it is true that there are communities where police are trusted and respected less than they are in others. Some African-American neighborhoods have negative opinion, high negative opinions of police. These levels are a subject of concern, but in the studies I have seen, they rarely rise to majority. And I give you an example. When I was in the state police, law and order had broken down in East St. Louis an almost overwhelmingly African-American town, subject to terrible corruption, inefficiency, so bad that the mayor asked the state police to intervene, and I agreed, because the situation became intolerable. So I had state police patrolling the streets of East St. Louis, and the first two nights I patrolled with them. I'm riding in a car with a trooper, and we stop um, uh, a traffic violator Fairly serious speeding, perfectly sober, 52-year-old African-American who was extremely upset, extremely upset at getting this ticket, came just short of yelling about how injustice was and how unfair it was. Police officer kept, the trooper kept his, his cool and said, sir, this is what we have you recorded. I am writing you the ticket. If you have some difficulty with this, the court date is here, right here in the ticket. And he pointed out to him. And if you would like to change that date, all you have to do is go to the court and ask them to change the date because they have others that are available. And he walks away and he's stamping his feet on the floor, on the street, and he's slamming doors and doing a bunch of other things, slamming uh, his trunk down because his trunk had opened, he'd pushed the wrong button inside the, the car. And then there was this little pause. And he turned back and said, in a not particularly happy voice, but I never forget his saying this, he said, I'm glad to see you men are here. Now, this is, I think, more typical of the average citizen, even when you have a lousy police force. Generally speaking, they trust the police. This is absolutely lost on the, on the individual police officer. And there are other examples of this. The police officers were always terribly afraid of, um, of tape recording confessions. Because the way police officers get confessions involves usually a fair amount of rudeness and threat. No physical violence, but legal threats. And police officers, oh, they're going to think that the guy's intimidated. Surveys was done of the response to a program called NYPD Blue, in which they showed not only um, a verbally coercive tactics, but they actually showed in a couple of cases a police officer hitting somebody. And uh, getting, Jimmy Smith did that once. And getting a confession. And they, they used to show this to people, academics show this to people, and they found high approval ratings in police conduct even then, even in things which the courts have said you can't do. But that is a fact that, to which the, the average police officer has to be continually reminded. 
And one of the reasons they have to be reminded is you don't want a police officer on the street who thinks the public doesn't like him because that kind of police officer presents a danger. The next problem, the next thing a police chief has to deal with is the media in general. Um, the problem the police, has to the police chief has to deal with, of course, is the impression of the media not on a particular, the police have not on a particular story, but that the, poli that the media over-reports police failures and bad acts of police officers. Um, meaning rare instances are reported as if they were par for the course and not the exception. The good work of the police, they say, never merits coverage. Um, and th this could be true where some individual newspaper or television decides it can increase sales or revenue by waging a campaign against the police. I have not seen much of that. What I have seen is generally favorable coverage of the police, particularly their triumphs. I have seen generally restrained reporting of alleged or even proved bad acts, partly because they're alleged and the papers are concerned about not overplaying the story. Um, moreover, what is criticized as inaccurate reporting is not a police problem. It's a problem common to all human activities. Almost anybody here, if you've ever been involved in something, some incident that was reported or some study that was reported, in the newspapers, most of you will think that they didn't get it all. And some will think they got it wrong completely. And part of that is the era of the well-staffed well expert report staffs are pretty much gone. Uh, most, report, most newspapers are down to bare bones now. And the significance of that is is even when they report something that's bad, even when the newspapers report something that's bad, there is much less risk they will be believed. Harold Evans, who was at one time <coughs> the editor of the Sunday Times of London and once editor of the Times of London, wrote a terrific book about his career in journalism. And he remembered when he was young, people would say about something that was in contention. They would say, be true, I saw it in the papers. You don't hear that much today and you're not likely ever to hear it again. Moreover, the police and the media have another kind of relationship. Um, I, I am of the view that one major city, and it was not Chicago, it's quite a distance away from here, um, in one a media enterprise, one particular television station, had concluded that the city's police department should be raked over the coals. Um, this is many decades ago. The police, the media was sensationalized, their leadership. Um, the media, when, when the police first started saying this, the media responded in editorial saying, we think the police chief and his force are not respecters of human rights. That's why we're doing this. In the end, after about a four-month battle, the media restrained itself. Why did it restrain itself? Because it was convinced of the justness of the police system? And the response? I don't think so. They did it because they restrained themselves after the police themselves started restraining their own release of information to this particular news station um, uh, while giving it to all of the others. In simple terms, the media needs the police uh, much more than the police need the media. The media's power to beat up a hapless police department is in almost every city vastly overrated by the rank and file. But it's a fact. They fear the media. They conceal things in the media that they shouldn't conceal. When they get interviewed and an accusation is made, they look guilty, even if they're not, because they are afraid of the media. This is another thing the police chief has to deal with. And you can't just stand up at the academy and have some guy lecture on this. It has to be demonstrated over and over and over again. The last thing that the police chief has to worry about is police effectiveness. The basic professional quandary of any police chief, as opposed, for example, to the physician who I started with as the um, appropriate analogy, is, is that 
you actually never know whether some off-the-wall idea from an untrained community, community activist may be valid. You, you have to hesitate when the people start coming in and complaining to you, even if it was not politically necessary for you to listen to them, you still have to listen to them. Because one of the oddest facts of the service is this. There is only one area, one, just one, area of police work that can indisputably be proven to save the lives of our citizens. And it's not the homicide division. It's the traffic police. They can establish statistically that if at a certain period of time they patrol a certain area of the highway intensively, uh, the fatality rate goes down. And if they pull it back, the fatality rate goes up. And this has been replicated all over the country. So that's what you have as a police chief. The one thing you absolutely know works. Um, it's also proven, I think, and I think means that there is some a little doubt, that crime does increase in the absence of police in general. But this is based on police strike data uh, and police layoff data. The layoff data is actually more reliable. The problem with police strike data is police strikes are very public. The entire world knows that the police have gone on strike, and you usually have an enormous spike in crime. Um, and, and not... Uh, the, 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 they're mostly public order crimes. People start raging through stores and shoplifting, and they start breaking windows and do... The murder rate has not, generally speaking, does not go up. Um, the armed robbery generally does not go up. But there are spikes in crime when you don't have police. The degree of them is highly uncertain. It's not like the traffic police who can tell you, if we do this, we will, over the next six months, save six to eight lives. It gets that specific. And it's been validated over and over again. The, the relationship of order maintenance as crime prevention is not clear. Well, suppose you don't have broken windows. Suppose you break up kids standing on the street. Uh, suppose you do quality of life arrests as uh, they are commonly called in New York. Suppose you do all of those things. Um, most police don't regard it as a crime stopper. May, may improve quality of life, but it doesn't stop crime. It doesn't particularly decrease crime. Do we know the answer to that? No. Could the police officers be right that it doesn't stop crime? We don't know that either. Um, uh, many policies including one I adopted many years ago when I was in the business that seemed promising don't work. The policy I adopted was routinely to arrest a spouse or partner when there was a credible allegation of domestic violence by that person, separate them, make the, the, um, the aggressive spouse realize this was serious business. <clears throat> and there was a lot of data that supported this would probably reduce. Um, domestic violence. Some research, recent research, has suggested that it may not decrease violence, but rather increase it over time. Because the, the, um, the husband who beats the wife, um, the, the wife stands and says, and I've actually personally seen this, I said, don't take him away, don't take him away. I, I once had a woman who was bleeding profusely from a cut in her arm obviously had a climbing bruise on the cheek, said, no, 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 don't arrest them. And in fact, it's one of the things about domestic violence that was so dangerous is there are a fair number of cases where a police officer has been attacked with a weapon as he leads away the arrested spouse. Leaving that aside, because that's an officer's judgment of what to do in a particular situation. What frequently, what has, has turned out to be the case is the arrest infuriates, and the fury is carried out on the spouse. So this policy that we had made every sense in the world. We had enormous support from various groups that were concerned about domestic violence. And I've noticed from some of the police literature, I read that that pressure has begun to diminish somewhat. But I didn't adopt that program because I had a bunch of people 
thinking that I ought to. I adopted it because I thought it would work. And I looked at the statistics and I was careful. And here it is years later that maybe I did the wrong thing. There are also no proactive police uh, solutions to some problems, mostly crimes which occur between family members. Now, all of this <clears throat> uh, has to be viewed in light of something which somebody once called the uh, subtext of the public consciousness. Um, and that is a perception, sometimes inarticulate, but there nonetheless, that any crime, any crime, is somehow a failure of a crime prevention program. Not true, <clears throat> couldn't possibly be true, but it is a perception. Put more simply, <clears throat> if there was a crime, there must have been some police failure. You go back far enough, there must be some police failure. <clears throat> the same thing is said about judicial sentencing practices. Somebody, you, you might give, for example, somebody a sentence of 10 years for shoplifting, almost unheard of, longest ever. Person gets out and shoots somebody. Judge, how could you give only 10 years? That person had been in prison, that shooting never would have occurred. Um, Nobody thinks that this is absolutely a serious, open proposition that should be the basis of decision, but it's in the back of their minds. That every single situation involves um, some uh, police failure. And there is, there's actually a study, the source of which I have misplaced, I looked for, that suggests that there is one particular group of people and they picked this group of people. They didn't discover them in a randomized study. Uh, there's one particular group of people who have less, a less favorable opinion of police than any other group, and that is victims of crime such as impaired driving. Because in the back of their mind is, why was that man on the road? And the answer has to be that there was some kind of failure of the police. Um, now, perhaps, uh, you might understand why, after listing all these problems, the police chief's best of all possible worlds is a world where nothing happens and nobody notices, because then you can just go about doing your business. Like every best possible world I know of, uh, this world never has and never will exist but the idea and its influence lingers on. With all of that, I have one small coda. Um, you can't apply the rule across the board because there's one particular class of events and one particular class of persons uh, that you have to be concerned about because some crimes and some criminals are served if you don't want to have it noticed. And these are, those are among the most toxic offenses to an ordered society and that is ingrained civilian and governmental corruption. Uh, for that, the police chief's rule is to hope that nothing like this happens. But if it does, and you know it will, the hope is that your officers are the ones who, through persistent vigilance, notice it first and best. So the rule is not absolute, but I think you can understand why I love that rule so much. <clears throat>